The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorf. Every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to talk about schematics, which are a basic part of any electronics project. We'll discuss what the symbols mean and how to go from schematic to a working project. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today on Ben News, a recap on the 2013 Bay Area Maker Fair I just got back from. It was a lot of fun. I assume they had a record attendance yet again because it was jam-packed. Some of my favorite things were the uh, glove-controlled giant iron robot hand that was like smashing things out in the parking lot, and also seeing a lot of new products in general. And of course, there were tons of 3D printers everywhere. And I guess there's a new printer bot that runs off the Raspberry Pi. Very cool. So why are schematics important? Well, very few examples online are going to actually show you physical connections between components, you know, wires and whatnot. That's very basic stuff. Most of it's going to involve schematics, so if you want to be able to make circuits and be inspired by things you see online, you're going to need to be able to read schematics. So what we're going to do today is go over some of the most basic symbols you'll find in a schematic, and then we'll put together a schematic that we find online so you can see the steps. So here are the most basic symbols. Here's a resistor, it's a bunch of wavy lines, usually the value will be written below it. Here's a variable resistor or a potentiometer, here's the two sides of the potentiometer. Here's the center, the tap or the wiper that moves. This is a resistor with lines coming into it, the lines represent light, so this is a photoresistor. Down here we have a couple capacitors, it's either going to be a line and a curved line or just two lines. Of course some capacitors are polarized, electrolytic capacitors. Sometimes there'll be a plus sign telling you which side is polarized, but not always. So how you know is, if the measurement is in microfarads, you know, like 10 microfarads, 1 microfarad, you know it's an electrolytic capacitor. And then if you don't know which side goes to ground, well, the side that goes this way to the ground symbol or toward the bottom of the diagram, that's ground. Just double check, don't hook up your electrolytic capacitor backwards. Here's a diode, current flows in this direction, can't go this way. Here's a light emitting diode. Again, things coming in or out of components are represented by arrows. Thus, here is a photo-detecting diode, perhaps an IR diode. Up here we have our two basic transistors, NPN, PNP. They look very similar except for the arrows going in a different direction, see that? Here's a switch. Here's a push button. M is for motor, so uh, here's the two sides of the motor, so typically you see an H bridge over here. Here's some basic symbols. This one means ground. This one also means ground. And sometimes for positive voltage you'll see like a hollow arrow pointed up. Now again, in a schematic, down toward here, the bottom's ground, upper side is always going to be positive voltage. But sometimes they don't always have components, especially if it's like a schematic of a larger design. There might be a sub-assembly over here, like oh here is the video circuit. And it's not connected to the larger design, but you'll see a ground or positive voltage symbol and that's how you know, oh, that's what connects to the, those rails. An integrated circuit is typically represented by like a box with some lines coming out of it. This, the box doesn't represent the physical package of the circuit, rather the connections to it. And then finally down here, since we're just going to be working with DC, a battery. Here's a positive side, negative, again, positive goes up, negative goes down. So now that we have some basic ideas of what's in a schematic, we're going to find a schematic online, like you might, and wire it up in breadboard form. So I'll take you through the steps. Now that we've gone through the basic symbols of a schematic, I'm going to simulate what an experimenter might do at home. I'm going to download a schematic off the internet and use it to wire up a breadboard. This way I can take you through all the steps and show you how the symbols relate to each other. I went online and I found a circuit for a touch switch, kind of like a lamp a sensor and it uses a 555 timer in the circuit. So I printed out the schematic and I have it right here. Here are the parts we're going to need. A 1 mega ohm resistor, 100k ohm resistor, NPN transistor, 10 microfarad capacitor, 10 nanofarad capacitor, the 555 timer itself, 330 ohm resistor for the LED and the LED itself to indicate that it's on. For our power supply, we have our bench power supply here on the positive and negative side. Pitch 
pitching your big idea to senior management? Easier said than done. Researching, designing, and prototyping your big idea using the node on Element 14? Yup, much easier. Discover how we're listening to your feedback and building a better experience. On this type of integrated circuit, the pins go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So in our diagram here, we see pins 8 and 4 are connected to positive 6 volts. So I'm going to take our 555 and put it on this breadboard here. All right. Pins 8 and 4 go to positive voltage. So on this breadboard, you'll see there's two lines. There's a positive line and a negative line on each side. And those are connected all the way down separately. And then on the breadboard, these are connected across. Well, that, 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 and then this, this, this. So if we want to connect pins 8 and 4 to positive voltage, we go like that. I should be using red wires for this, but I don't have any. Okay. All right, there's eight and four connected. We'll just go through this counterclockwise and make sure we get everything. We have a 100K ohm resistor going from positive voltage to seven and then also to six. So if we look at seven and six, they are interconnected. But this little jump here means two is not connected to them. So I made this little U-shaped wire and I will just jump that between seven and six since they are interconnected. There we go. Now the 100K ohm goes from positive voltage to seven. So I'll just bend it like that and go from my positive voltage rail to pin seven. All right. Now let's go down the line. All right, so that to that, these are interconnected. Here's our uh, electrolytic capacitor from six to ground. And over here in our breadboard, we have ground on this side. So I will just do this, pin six on the positive side of the electrolytic capacitor. On the electrolytic capacitor, uh, it has a stripe, that means ground or negative, and then the one without a stripe is positive. Again, don't hook up your electrolytic capacitor backwards. All right, so seven and six are interconnected. Now we see that six goes into the positive side of electrolytic capacitor. And then the bottom of that goes, or the negative of that goes to ground. So I'll just put that right here. Pin six, and then to ground. All right, that's complete. Let's go up here. One mega ohm resistor goes from positive five volts to pin two. So we'll do that first. All right, so we're gonna hook up the one mega ohm resistor from positive five volts. Snake it over here to pin two. There we go. Okay, pin two is also connected to the um, collector of the NPN transistor. So we're gonna put our, we'll put our transistor over here actually, separate. And then the collector will be the pin on the left or the top of this transistor. So collector, that also goes to two. All right, so that's the connection we just made. The center of it, the base goes to our touch plate. We'll attach that later. And the emitter of the transistor goes to ground. So over here, the third wire, will attach that to ground and there, okay. All right, we got that much done. Uh, touch plate, we can use, uh, well, for now, I'll just use this wire here. We'll attach it to something metal later. All right, we're gonna go counterclockwise and make sure we got everything. Oh, we have a part here our 10 nanofarad capacitor from pin five. Okay, so pin five is going to be one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that, again, pin one goes to ground as well. So I'm gonna stick this here. Come on. All right. Pin one also goes to ground, so I'll just go up here. There we go. All right, now we just need our output. So pin three goes into the LED. And then the LED goes through a resistor to, you guessed it, ground. All things lead to ground. All right. 
go over our circuit. Looks like we have everything. As you notice, by laying the parts out on our schematic, we use them up one by one, and now that we know, now we know we've used everything because we picked them all up. That's a good way to keep track of what you've completed on your schematic. So I'm going to just take some of these leads that I always save off components, like resistors and whatnot. I'm just going to stick them in here. There's a positive, and this will be negative. Now I can hook up my rail power supply for my bench. There we go. Now we can test it. I'll turn on my power supply. Now I soldered the touch wire to this piece of brass here. So when I touch it, I will act as a ground source and trigger the circuit. Now when I let go, it'll stay on for a little bit because of the capacitor we hooked up. If I put in a larger capacitor, it will stay on for a longer amount of time. Although that's not the proper way you would do that. Okay. See? Now if you're actually trying to use this for some sort of, you know, on-off touch control, we can use the flip-flop, which is basically a one-bit memory circuit. So you'd be on, off, on, off. But the idea here was to show you a simple schematic and how the schematic translates to something that you build. Today's viewer question comes from Sean who asks, I have an old HTC Magic cell phone. Is there anything I can do with it? Hardware wise, I'd say no. Phones are not very user serviceable and hard to take apart, but it can run Android. So you can possibly use it to control other devices. You should also be able to put a newer version of Android on it using CyanogenMod. Finally, there's always donation or recycling. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to build a cool coin-op device like they used to have in arcades, when there used to be arcades. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS, where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.